I love going live. Oh, we already have some questions. That's awesome. Okay, well, I, as you can tell, I'm sitting on the floor in my living room because it's the easiest way to take care of little Pablito, who's right next to me. You're gonna hear him cooing. Um, and probably Lucy will come in at some point as well. But let's get started. Um, I love doing Q and A's and doing lives because it really gives me a chance to address the questions you all have in real time. So let's see, my questions were up, um, but I'll need to go back to them right now. Let me see, where did they go? Here we go. All right. So our first question was 14 weeks and already having trouble staying asleep, any remedies? Sleep can be really problematic in pregnancy and it's frustrating because everyone tells you, oh, you're not gonna sleep when the baby gets here and you're like, gee, thank you. So what do I do to sleep now? So a ton of things that I recommend for sleep. Um, one of them is make sure you stay active and exercise during the day. I know it's, you're exhausted, especially in the first trimester, but getting in movement will help prep your body to know, oh, we're gonna have to go back to sleep and we get energy out during the day. There are other things to do, obviously having good sleep hygiene, like not looking at screens for an hour before bed, doing meditation, using your bed only as a place for sleep, et cetera, are really helpful as well. Um, there are pharmacologic things you can use. Some people think magnesium supplements can help with sleeping. Um, I get a little bit of mixed reviews on that, but some people swear by them. The other thing is that you can use melatonin in pregnancy. Now, melatonin isn't really studied in pregnancy, so some people say, oh, there's no data, don't use it. But taking a melatonin supplement is really similar to the melatonin your body naturally makes. And so I tell people, you know, there's not really data, but like if you just use an amount, maybe on the lower end, like three milligrams, it should be fine and safe. And then finally, my favorite one is using Unisom. Unisom is a medicine that's similar to Benadryl. It's a type of antihistamine and it is really good for nausea. So you kind of get two birds with one stone if you take Unisom at night. It's safe to use to sleep and it helps with nausea. So that's probably my favorite one. Let's go back. Our next one is, hi Marta, thank you for your videos. You've been very helpful, looking forward to this. Glad you're here, thank you for being here. 34, next one is 34 weeks, and if, and if one tested positive early around 24 weeks for GBS, will they retest again? Despite me taking antibiotics the first time, I really wish these would stay up. Despite me taking antibiotics the first time, around why do they want to retreat before labor? This is a great question. I actually have a video on GBS. It was one of the first ones I uploaded. So it's important to know that GBS isn't an infection. It is a normal type of bacteria for the vaginal and rectal and GI microbiome. It is not a problem for the pregnant person at all. And we don't even test it in people who aren't pregnant. It's only a problem because of the specific way babies' immune systems are set up. If babies contract it when they're young, they can get really, really sick. So some people are what's called GBS colonizers, meaning GBS is a normal part of their microbiome. Not a problem, except if the baby is exposed to it. Some people are GBS like partial colonizers. So there's kind of maybe a waxing and waning presence of GBS. And some people are non-colonizers. But most people are gonna be in that middle where they're Sometimes have GBS, sometimes not. So if we ever detect GBS during pregnancy, the recommendation is to give antibiotics during the labor process. And once it's been positive at some point in pregnancy, like sometimes it can be positive in a urine culture, it's usually not from the urine, it's usually just from the vaginal microbiome that the urine picked up in the test, we do recommend treating. And again, because it's a normal bacteria that waxes and wanes, when you get treatment for it in labor, it's not like a huge amount of antibiotics. It's very small just to take care of a little bit of it to protect the baby. So it's not like you'll get rid of GBS. It's, GBS is a normal bacteria. It's not problematic for you, just the baby. That's why we treat during labor. All right, that was a great question. Definitely watch that GBS video I have also. Love your videos, thank you so much. I'm 34 weeks and the baby is breached. We're trying lots of things, but can you speak about EV, EVC?
Okay, we got kicked off there, but we're back. This question was about ECV, which is an external cephalic version. And what that means is when a baby is in a non-head down presenting position, I'm gonna fix my baby right now, then, which is either like transverse or breech, then what we can do is usually at 37 weeks is the best time to do it. The doctors can take a pregnant person and usually we do it with an epidural and the healthcare providers, doctors or midwives, attempt to use their hands on the outside of the belly, external, to try to turn the baby into a cephalic presentation, cephalic version. So it's something that can be done to avoid C-sections for breach. Um, there are certain things that make it more or less successful, like if it's uh, not your first pregnancy, it's more likely to be successful. If you have a normal amount of fluid, um, if the placenta is not in the front, but anyone can try it. Even if you have those things that make it less successful, it's still worth a shot. I'm a fan of ECV. I think it's a great way to reduce C-sections, um, but it may not always work. And definitely you can talk about it with your doctor. I'll do a video on that too. I really want to do a video on that. So I'll put that on the list. All right. Hi, Dr. Mara, just found your videos the other day. I'm Cuban, I think you are too. My question is omega-3 and glay glucosamine safe during pregnancy. I just turned 38. I am Cuban, my dad is from Cuba. Michael's, both of his parents are from Cuba, so our son is 75% Cuban. And glucosamine is just a supplement. I mean, I don't think it's been studied during pregnancy. I would ask the reason behind taking it. Most supplements are ineffective and only uh, make changes to your wallet, not necessarily your body. But for omega-3s, yes, we definitely recommend incorporation of healthy fatty acids like DHA specifically is the type of omega-3 that we wanna see and DHA during pregnancy. But the best way to get things is really through diet. So I would encourage you to eat the cold water, high DHA containing seafood um, and a well-rounded diet. Taking supplementation is fine. Supplementation of DHA and prenatal vitamins, I do recommend. And if your prenatal doesn't have it, you can find one that it that does. Um, I will go like further into some prenatal vitamins. That's definitely on my list of topics as well. You always wanna discuss any supplements that you're taking with your doctor. So this is just be general. I'm not a big fan of supplements. The less, the better. You know, taking a prenatal with folic acid, and I do recommend DHA is great, but again, I'm, I'm more of a minimalist with that, so you're gonna to wanna to talk to your doctor. All right, the next one is also wondering, do women lose follicles while pregnant? I saved 25, 25 follicles. At age 37, was wondering if I should get pregnant or freeze one more cycle. Yeah, so that's gonna be an advanced fertility question. It sounds like you're under the care of a fertility doctor doing egg preservation. And so I'm not a fertility specialist. Um, typically, we don't see like a decrease in fertility because someone is pregnant. However, you're pregnant for the better part of a year and fertility decreases with age. So I would discuss specific questions like you had with your fertility specialist doctor. That's gonna be the best place to get those questions answered. All right. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge. Do you have any experience with incompetent cervix? Do women with cerclages tend to deliver earlier or soon after they get the stitch removed? So I do have experience with patients who have cervical insufficiency, which we like better than incompetent cervical insufficiency and receive cerclages, but that's really personalized care. And I can't, it would take me probably an hour to discuss all of the kind of com complex things around diagnosis of cervical insufficiency and cerclages and who's good candidates and the outcomes for cerclages, et cetera. So I won't get into that here, but that's definitely something you wanna to talk to a high-risk OB doctor about, an MFM doctor, because they're the specialists that really specialize in cerclages and cer cervical um, insufficiency. Next, getting my vaccine this Sorry, friends. I don't know why my my internet is usually really good. I don't know why it keeps going up. But the next question was about getting the vaccine while breastfeeding. And the person said, I know you did it. Any words of wisdom? So the answer to that is yes, I did get the vaccine while breastfeeding. I didn't change anything about my breastfeeding and I didn't notice any 
different effects about breastfeeding or in my son or anything. Um, and I would say it sounds like what, since you've already decided to get the vaccine, it sounds like what you're struggling with is just unknowns and feeling like this decision wasn't either zero or a hundred for you and that you were kind of in the middle. You recognize that you want the vaccine and you chose to get it, but you also may be struggling with just some of the unknowns and that maybe this wasn't like the most obvious choice for you and there's a lot of things you considered. So my advice then when we make decisions that are hard for us is just to give yourself peace and acceptance. Remind yourself why you made the decision and how important that decision was to you and how you're doing the very best thing for you and your family's health no matter what. And if you remind yourself why you make important decisions and what brought you to that, I think that helps bring peace because it sounds like what you're really struggling with is just all of the unknown and the frustration around the lack of knowledge about lactation and pregnancy and the vaccine. All right, we haven't seen any new questions come in yet. Let's see, I covered, I covered the ECV and the GBS. Make sure you watch that video. Oh, I think I missed one. I, I asked my nurse midwife about scheduling a 39 week elective induction at my 20 week appointment. She said she preferred to wait until 38, 39 weeks to decide, is that the norm? Thanks. Um, I would ask her why. Again, in my induction video, as I saw, I tended to recommend bringing it up a little earlier just because sometimes the reservations at labor and delivery um, are hard to get. So if you ask about it at 38 weeks, they may not have a place for you the next week. And some labor and deliveries may not even do 39 week elective inductions because they don't have room. So I would just ask her the why behind waiting till 38, 39 weeks and then bring it up again. Um, maybe you know 28 weeks or something like that at the beginning of the third trimester, which usually would be 20 of room. If your nurse midwife says, you know, I don't believe the ARRIVE trial or I don't, I'm familiar with the ARRIVE trial, but I don't like agree with it or something, you can just say, thank you for your opinion on it. But like, you know, I, in understanding the ARRIVE trial or thinking about induction, think this would be right for me. And they should respect your autonomy with that. Autonomy is the most important thing when it comes to pregnancy care. All right, do you know anything about circumvallate placenta? I do, I do know things about circumvallate placenta, but I suspect you were asking for even more information. Um, I also wanna do more of a placenta video. I had a marginal cord insertion in my placenta and I got a lot of questions about marginal cord insertion and circumvallate placentas. So some of these things are meaningful, sometimes they're not at all. Sometimes they're picked up on ultrasound, sometimes we don't even know until delivery that there was one of these issues going on. Again, I'll go more of a deep dive into the data. Occasionally we think that abnormal placentas could possibly contribute to babies being smaller, what's called intrafetal growth restriction um, or like placental insufficiency, but it's not a super strong relationship. So it's not something that's a huge danger or anything. It's more something that we sometimes see Again, sometimes we see it on ultrasound before and sometimes we don't even diagnose it till birth. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's something to be really, really concerned about. And I can take a deep dive into the data um, when I do a video on it. All right, found out, congratulations, and congratulate and contact my ob from now when I am around 12 weeks and that's normal. So the timing of the first ob is it depends a lot on the practice setting and where you are. I know that in some countries, it's very common not to have a visit or ultrasound till 12 weeks. In other places, a doctor's office may bring you in earlier. Usually the time of the first ultrasound is around eight to 10 weeks um, is what I see more commonly. Um, again, I don't know some of the background behind your situation, so always call back and just ask. I mean, express that, say that you would like to be seen sooner if you feel like you need to, or you could try um, looking for a different practice. This connection is just not great. Okay, for the person terrified of needle surgery, etc., not pregnant yet, that is okay. I have had patients definitely that are scared of needles and um, kind of medical intervention. One thing I'd recommend is if something is 
going to bring you a lot of stress, then the best thing to do preemptively is try to manage that stress. Phobias are actually something that cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, that you can work on with a psychologist or psychiatrist is super, super effective at treating. So that can be an option for you. You can start before pregnancy. Another thing is that you can work with your healthcare provider to kind of set expectations. You know, we don't use a blood draw or needle at every single pregnancy visit, but you can have like a list of them and create kind of a plan for it. So that's what I would recommend is be proactive, get into CBT and therapy to try to work on those fears ahead of time if you can. If you can't, definitely we can work with you in pregnancy to try to make you as calm and get all the information we need to take really good care of you at the same time. These are such good questions. I'm so glad you guys are here. What are the recommendations on induction for VBAC? Okay, so this was a really popular comment on my induction of labor video. And I have to say that it's a really, it's a topic I'm passionate about as well. When the ARRIVE trial came out, reading it was really interesting. And my next thought immediately was, but what about VBACers? Um, I absolutely would love to see a huge trial like the ARRIVE trial, specifically in VBACers. Induction with VBACers is a little bit, can be controversial a little bit in the OBGYN field. Um, some people feel comfortable doing an induction for VBACers. We can't use the same medications. We can only use Pitocin and manual cervical dilation. We can't use those um, prostaglandin medications I talked about in the induction video because they can increase the, use, the risk of uterine rupture. So we're a little bit hands are tied in terms of our tools for induction. Other people don't feel comfortable with induction. So having having an induction is associated with a higher chance of failed or failed VBAC, but so is ongoing pregnancy past 39 weeks. So for people who haven't gone into labor at 39 weeks, we don't know the answer of is it what is better, having an induction or waiting for labor. And I would love to know the answer to that, but we just don't know. So you're going to want to talk to your doctor about it. All right. Thanks for all the information you provide. Does high blood pressure that presents before 20 weeks with no previous history mean potential for high blood pressure to stay post-delivery? Yes, if you have high blood pressure before 20 weeks, that counts as chronic hypertension because your blood pressure should actually be lower in the first trimester than in your non-pregnant state. So if you have high blood pressures in the beginning of pregnancy, what that tells me is that you actually do have high blood pressure. You have high blood pressure outside of pregnancy. And having chronic hypertension does increase the risk of preeclampsia within pregnancy and of course we wouldn't expect it to just go away after pregnancy either since it was present before pregnancy as well. Um, the, having chronic hypertension is an indication to take aspirin therapy to help decrease the risk of preeclampsia and I go all over all of that in both the part one and part two preeclampsia episodes so definitely check those out for more information. All right, when I was 19, I had a mucinous ovarian tumor, five pounds on my right side, my ovaries, my ovary was removed. I was able to have four normal pregnancies. My question is what may have caused a tumor and how common is it? So mucinous ovarian tumors um, are typically cared for by an OBGYN who may have it the first time, but if they recur, they may be taken care of by a gynecologic oncologist. Just telling me the ovary tumor was mucinous doesn't give me enough information to talk to you about recurrence risk um, or other associations. So I'm, I can't quite speak to that. It's a little bit too in, in um, specific and I would need more information as your doctor to talk to you more about. But I'm really glad that you've had successful pregnancies, which goes to show that even with one ovary, um, our fertility isn't necessarily reduced. It's kind of like that other ovary can pick up the slack of the one ovary, which is nice. Am I at risk for the copper IUD moving by using menstrual cups? So this can be a hot topic on social media. The, there are theoretical risks that if you're pulling on your menstrual cup out of your vagina without breaking the suction that you could kind of suck and misplace an IUD. So all I tell people is just the correct way to use a menstrual cup is to break the suction before you remove it anyway. And so that would be what you should do. Just make sure you break the suction and then it shouldn't move your IUD. Theoretically, I guess if your strings are between, if you're pulling on the cup also without breaking the suction, the strings are there, it could pull on the strings, either the suction or pull on the strings, but just break the suction first and then it shouldn't be a problem at all. And that's the way it's gonna be most comfortable and best to use a menstrual cup anyway.
All right, we'll do, it's been about 20 minutes. We've got lots of great questions here. Um, I'm so glad you guys came to join me on this. And this was just a really fun Friday thing when I just didn't get to editing this week. You know, part of the background of why I didn't get to editing is that even though I'm on maternity leave, I'm not going into work. Ah, I'm doing some of my academic work, like papers and research, and I put a lot of pressure on myself to get things done and be a present mom. And I realized that maternity leave was going by too fast, and I was not enjoying him as much as I should because I had this idea of all the things I should do. So I let go of the shoulds this week and just said, I'm gonna be present in the moment. It was really nice. So thank you so much for joining me in this present moment. And I hope you guys have a really lovely weekend. This, of course, will be saved to my profile so you can refer back to it.